It's our second edition of Legends with Leiden, and I'm pleased to be in the home of Jim Craig. Thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, it really is. You're on the short list of people who I wanted to sit down and talk to when I came up with this concept because your legendary status in sports takes you from Massachusetts to an international stage, which at the age you were in 1980, you could have never predicted. So I'll get into some specific questions, but broad strokes, how have you handled over your life the instant fame and everything that's come with it over the course of 35 years? I think what helps you is your family values. You know, and um, having you know a structure built for you when you're younger, and utilizing all the resources that you have and the mentors that you have in your lifetime, and um, once you make a mistake, learn from it and just try to get better. All right, let's, we're going to go back in time. We're going to talk about a lot of stuff during this conversation, and I want to take us right back to the late '70s, when you must have had your eyes set on being the goaltender for the U.S. Olympic team. At what point did you know that that might be a possibility, and when did it start to crystallize and really become clear in your mind that you could be the guy? Well, uh, Herb started with the National Sports Festival, which uh, many people know today because it's with all sports, but it took the best hockey players from the Northeast, the Midwest, the West, the Mid-Atlantic, and uh, you competed, and sometimes you played on each other's team. And if you were invited to the sports festival, that was a pretty good indicator that somebody was at least looking at you. Um, and then in 1979, I was selected by Herb uh, to go to Moscow, Leningrad, Moscow, and play for the World Championships. And uh, playing over there and playing with the best competition in the world, because the best competition didn't play in the National Hockey League, they couldn't. There was a Cold War going on, and so the best players played for their countries. And so I was competing against the best players in the world, and uh, that was an, uh, I think that was an indicator that I had a chance. You had to balance, I'm sure, confidence with what Herb must have instilled is an insane humility. He must have kept the entire team very humble, but yet you still had to have that confidence in knowing that you could play well. How did you balance that? Because you've got to be confident between the pipes. Well, um, you know, you need swagger. And swagger is an ability to be able to back up what you, what you do. And, and that you can only have by doing really hard work and talent. And so you can't have false bravado. You really have to be able to do the things you do and do them well to have any type of swagger or confidence. And um, uh, believing in oneself is probably the biggest thing that all sports psychologists now teach you, whether it's a golfer or you know, a baseball player or anybody. It's really about creating that inner spirit, that inner uh, ability to bring yourself to higher levels. All right, so as the stories are told, we learn that there's a Massachusetts faction on the team and there's a Minnesota faction on the team. Is that overblown? No, and it, the Massachusetts was all BU. You know, it was guys that we all played together. It was Jack and Mike and David and I, and, and basically Herb's Minnesota team with a sprinkling or a few more. And I, I think what happens is when you go out there, you don't really know uh, because the leagues didn't play really against each other until it was the time for the nationals and stuff. So, but very quickly, uh, talent and personalities develop. You appreciate other people's talents, and um, you know we became a very tight knit team. I'm not going to recount the story of the exhibition game you played against the Russians, where you got crushed. Kind of set the stage for what became the biggest upset, which we'll talk about. But when you arrive to Lake Placid. Everything I see from it is that it was a very small place. How did it feel to you when you arrived there on the Olympic stage? It's tiny, you know, um, the Olympic Village now is a prison. Um, you know, we stayed in trailers. And so there were four of us in one trailer. Uh, my trailer was Billy Baker, Mike Arizioni, and Phil Fakoda. And there is a chair, enough room to barely get your shoulders through the door two beds and you know a common bathroom so it was a very small place but we, unlike other sports in the olympics you know we played seven games and we played before they even open up the olympics and we were there till the last day mm -hmm. most people have an event might last three minutes might last 30 seconds it really depends on what it is and then you enjoy the olympics and so we, we weren't there to enjoy the olympics we were there to win so you're focused throughout the whole thing. At what point 
did you know that you could make a significant run? I think when we tied Sweden, you know, uh, Sweden in the fashion that we did that. Uh, Sweden, if you go back and look at the players who played in the Olympic team, they all became really good pros. Uh, and um, they were a very good team. And then the momentum built a little bit when we beat Czechoslovakia and uh, it kept growing. And I think being in Lake Placid and having the, the um, the buildup of the the excitement of people from our own country made it helpful. Did you know? I mean, at that point, are you reading the newspaper? Are you flipping on the television? Did you have any inner sense that this was beginning to stick, not only around the United States, but around the world, what was going on with this small group of kids in a small town in upstate New York? No. Uh, we were so focused on doing what we did. We knew that we were developing and doing what we wanted to do and that we had committed to do and we had worked so hard to do. So it, it was really just enjoyable. It went by very, very quickly and um, very little time to get upset or be too happy about anything. It just was really on to the next. Do you have, can you recount any stories, maybe you talk about the trailers you were in, about the general conversations you would have had with your teammates as the two week period went along? Yeah, I, I, I think the biggest thing was the reinforcement of each other's confidence. You know, if somebody seemed like they weren't going to get a goal, you know, somebody would be there. But it was just the camaraderie and the laughter and, and the, uh, uh, the locker room. It just, you know, to this day, it's a locker room. <laughs> you know, we'll get to the fact that uh, people can, if interested, literally buy the things that you wore on your body, the jersey that you wore during the game against the Russians, when you pull that on and you're sitting in that locker room with everybody around you and everyone's wearing the white jerseys USA across the chest, we've seen it in the movie, but I want you to describe for me what that locker room was like before that game. Well, probably the greatest feeling is when you get off a bus, walk to the rink, and you go into an empty locker room and you see jerseys hanging up, and there's 20 of them, and one of them has your name. To me, it was a great time to reflect on all the hard work and sacrifice that people made for me and how I really tried to take advantage of that opportunity. Um, many people forget that the sacrifices that were done weren't done by the athlete. It was really about everybody else, whether it was a coach or mm -hmm. you know, mentors and people who gave you this opportunity. Uh, and the smart ones take advantage of that opportunity. And uh, myself and my teammates really took advantage of that opportunity. We get through the game. We've heard the story of the game recounted so many times. Fantastic. One of the best hockey games we've ever seen played. So much drama up and down, back and forth. The tension of the last eight minutes. The United States wins. Ultimately, you celebrate. Classic picture on the cover of Sports Illustrated. But at some point, you do take that jersey off. Did you ever think at that point, you couldn't have thought at that point, this is going to be one of the most memorable and most valuable pieces of sports memorabilia ever? No, you know, because the sport and the uh, jersey represents our country and, and a, a way of representing it. And so many people have wore a different type of jersey to protect our country. So. It's an honor and it's, a, and it's an obligation to uh, have that opportunity and that's what makes selling my stuff as a collection so important to me because I want somebody who can really take care of it, somebody who can display it, somebody who can really brag about that moment because I can't. You know, it's not something you go out telling people about. You can talk to them like I am with you, but it's an incredible moment in time. It's, uh, it's not like today. Tom, you know, it's, I think I'm going to hit my 500th home run. I'm going to wear a new shirt or a jersey mm -hmm. every inning, and then I'm going to sell it off. It's really about a moment in time, a special moment that needs to be protected uh, for future generations and, because it, re it represented so much more than a hockey game. So you've got great enjoyment out of the story for so many years. You win Friday, you come back Sunday, you beat Finland. Did you have some sleepless nights from Friday to Sunday? <laughs> Um, you know, I always tell people, um, uh, you know, I, I tell the people, those who succeed in life push a little harder every day, and the ones that don't wish they did years later. None of us on the team were going to have that be our thought. I wish I could have done mm -hmm. something different. We were committed to each other. We, were, uh, we knew the only way we were going to do something epic was collectively. 
And I think we were just prepared. And it's really easy to do your job when somebody lets you and somebody supports you and someone uh, helps you, you know. Um, it's when people try to do everybody else's job where it becomes difficult. And our, the sense I had with at least my teammates was that everybody knew what their job was. And as silly as that movie may sound or clips of Herb Brooks, play your game, play your game, everybody knew what their job was. And everybody knew what winning was. And everybody was committed for each other. And so I really think we, I slept good. I must have been tired, but I mean, I slept really well, you know. You reference the people who support you, and I know you're telling the truth because the iconic image of you skating around the rink with the flag over your shoulders asking where your dad is, I mean, that was a moment really to celebrate with your family, right? Yeah, it was a very private moment that was caught by ABC. You know, um, when you're able to do something so, as special as our team did and I was lucky enough to be part of, you really want to thank the people who uh, were part of it. And, we had just lost my mother, my father had lost his wife, and I knew that he'd be thinking of her, and I was thinking of her at the same time. And so it's been a respect thing. You know, my father was my best man at my wedding. My son's getting married in September a year from this September, and I've been asked to be his best man. So it's, it's, it's really an important thing. You know, uh, I always tell people whenever I'm doing my speaking engagement, why should you ever listen to me? And I tell them because of three really core values. Families first. You need to do the right thing, and everything you do needs to have integrity. And that's kind of what I was brought up with and um, what we've tried to live our lives with and exp express to our own children. As it wraps up, the experience with your friends that you've just done something incredible with. I loved, in one of the documentaries I heard, I forget who it was, say, all right, see ya. And it's just over. And it had been so long, so many years passed until you guys reunited, I think it was 2002. It was so scary for a couple of reasons. We're all at the White House. We're in the Rose Garden. Uh, the press secretary all of a sudden says, um, Northwest Flight 1423 to Minneapolis. I need Baker. I need Kristoff. I need Strobel. I need Janicek, I need, uh, and he starts naming up Broughton and, and, and all the guys from Minnesota. And then we realized for the first time, you know, we're not going to see these guys again. It's before cell phones. It's this before is, Twitter this, and Facebook, this is, right? This is like, you, they're going to be gone. You know, some of these guys are going to be playing the National Hockey League. Some of these guys are going back to school. But, you know, for every single day and doing something so special, and then all of a sudden get up and uh, I'll see you. What, yeah, when? You, you never really think about it. And then it hits you because that's when, you, that's when it hit me that that chapter was over. It was time to create another one. So at that point, I would guess, given your success and given how you'd been cultivated to play well between the pipes, you probably expected you to be a, a really good goalie in the National Hockey League. How do you assess the five-year period from 80 to 85, your professional career? Well. I don't think it was a success, that's for sure. Uh, I, I don't think I was ever able to focus until just at the end of my career when things are going really well. Um, every day I was interviewed, every place I went, mm -hmm. I became a, a media story. I was always bigger than the team and it felt very uncomfortable with that. Uh, my play suffered, I had too many options. And uh, the pressure of going from an underdog to an expectation of people thinking that I could do more was really hard. Um, and so when, I, uh, when Atlanta moved to Calgary and I went to Boston, I thought that would be great. But then the pressure of playing your own, your own city became really difficult. But then when I went to Minneapolis and played with the North Stars, the thing was going great. Um, the day I was playing against Detroit, I had a uh, three-year contract that we were signing in the morning. They were going to trade the other goalie, and I got hurt with five minutes left in the game for a career-ending injury that uh, kind of uh, ended my hockey career. But, you know, sport for me was always a vehicle. It was able to get me through to college and through college. It, it was able to get me to see the whole world, to do things I never would have been able to have done because that was my talent. That was the way I was going to get things done. And then when I got there, it, it was different. 
and it was hard. And um, it really made me stronger. All right, I want to get to the gist of what really has springboarded you back into the national spotlight here over the last month, which is the possible sale of all this merchandise. You've, yeah. There has to be people who look at you and say, you're crazy. I mean, you got a gold medal you earned, two jerseys, which are iconic, the flag which was over your shoulders. What brought you to the point that you felt comfortable parting with that? Well, Tom, for 35 years, most of my stuff has been displayed. It was in the Boston Sports Museum for the longest time. It was in the Sports Museum of America before it, it folded. Uh, it's been in the Hockey Hall of Fame. My kids, my niece and nephew, my great niece and nephews have taken it to school. You know, that's a good show to tell. Yeah, uh, and um, you know, so our financial planners said, you know, Jimmy you should get that stuff appraised. It's a process, a different chapter in our life. My wife and I are older. Our kids are older, growing up, and um, and when we did. You know, we're saying I have, we have two children, uh, our daughter who's 23 years old and our son's 26. You can't split a gold medal in half. You can't cut the flag in half. And so what we thought was we'd sell it as a collection, hoping that somebody would continue to display it and take the proceeds from that and do good. And that means protect our kids, kids and their legacy and something that we've worked really hard to do ourselves. And so that's what we're hoping to do and be able to do some things with charities that we've done in the past. And as we get a little older, I didn't want that responsibility to be with my kids. You know, what are you gonna do with a gold medal? You can't cut it in half. Mm -hmm. Who's gonna have it? I, I, don't wanna, I don't wanna be the one that does that. And so it wasn't displayed at home, it was in a safe. And it's, it, became, it became time to, to let somebody really enjoy it. 